for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, arvars, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. From there, he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered, entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Cyphoresian origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And when she went home, she found the child laying in on the bed and her demon gone. I have preached this text more than you might expect in my time at this church. It's come up in different ways. There are layers to it that are powerful. There are layers of it that deal with racism, that deal with suspicion and cultures. There are layers to it in how Jesus teaches in ways we don't expect and makes us uncomfortable hearing words that we might say are even dirty words coming on the lips of Jesus. I'll let you all look back on YouTube for those or wait for it to come up again. Today, I want to focus on the context and how it relates to us. Our story takes place in Tyre or Tyre, depending on how you want to pronounce it, along the Mediterranean would be present-day Lebanon, a little further north above Israel. It includes a woman who is Gentile, but the word in the original language is Hellenist. She's Greek. But, you know, foreigners are foreigners. Back then, Greece was a declining empire, and it had extended down into this area. So was she a part of the Greek empire, or was she... Greek in origin and culture and moved down to this area. We don't know. It also says she was Syrophoenician. That's a specific area within Syria at the time, what was known as Syria, right on the coast. The Phoenicians were fishermen. They were traders. They were travelers. It gives us a specific context from where she's from, which is not that far from Nazareth. You see, this whole area at one point was part of was part of Israel, the nation. This would have been the area of Asher among the brothers of Joseph when they divided up the land. By the time we get to the divided kingdom of Israel and Judah, this has broken off and become a part of another culture around them. The lines have changed. Jesus is crossing a border into another land that used to be a part of his people land, his land. Jesus is from Nazareth, which was part of that northern kingdom right along with this space we're in today. And he seems to have privilege in that space that a local doesn't have. He speaks with authority and she accepts the role of being one of the dogs in the analogy. This is just down the road from Samaria, which was also once part of the northern kingdom. But we know by the time Jesus comes along and tells the parable of the good Samaritan, they were other. They were different. So to those in Judah, down by Jerusalem, 
Those in the north were lesser. They got defeated first before the southern kingdom fell. They didn't have Jerusalem and the temple. They were different. To those in Nazareth and the north side of Palestine, those in Syria, those who are outside the bounds of the country are lesser. And to those in Syria, it seems like there was a lack of privilege compared to what Jesus and his friends held even in their own land. You want a fun analogy to go with this? Those who live in Mexico today are called Mexicans. Those who lived in this region we're in, when it was Mexico, are called Native Americans. Those who came back to homes of their ancestors by traveling north to go back to where their people are coming were originally from are called immigrants, sometimes deemed illegals. Those who go back to home of their ancestors by traveling south are called tourists. This is not the only strange construct of ethnicity and culture in our society, right? Our nation once lifted up white society living in big urban cities, urban elitism, while the black community was rural, not so civilized. Today, our black culture is tied closely to urban experiences, and whites talk about rural places as down home and wholesome. The blanket of sameness that is often cast over Asian communities has its own oddities. Japanese and Chinese cultures have sad histories in California. But today we see the tendency to conflate all Asians and Pacific Islanders into one group, losing the diversity of those communities, losing the diversity of those histories, forgetting the injustices that many experienced and combining them together so that we can forgive, conflate, and forget all at one time. So what does that have to do with our story today? Everything. This is a story about culture and bias, a story about hardened hearts and unclean thoughts, normalized and accepted. Jesus has been confronted by religious leaders just before this because the disciples were not washing their hands before they ate. As much time as they spent outdoors, and as little hygiene as there was in the world, this was a hang-up because they were breaking the extended understanding of the law's 613 rules. This is a story about culture and bias. Jesus had been confronted by the religious leaders for the disciples not washing their hands, and Jesus has just confronted them with a teaching about what comes out of the mouth is what makes you unclean, not what you put in it. Not what you put in it. Then the disciples asked Jesus to explain the teaching. Of all the teachings of Jesus, this seems pretty easy, right? We all do the same biological things. We all put food in, and then we all know there's a gross side to the back side of this, right? This has been part of human history since humans began being humans. The first one to eat was the first one to go to the bathroom. It's not a surprise. Yet they seem to struggle with the analogy. It's almost as if Jesus said, hate speech is bad. And they said, hate speech? What do you mean by that? It's almost as if someone said, racism is real. And someone asked, do you really think so? The very next thing that happens is our story is this poor woman, bless her heart, who walks in asking for help. Jesus has been in the midst of teaching the disciples something. They seem like they're refusing to learn. One plus one is two. And they're like, are you sure, Jesus? It'd be easier if it was whatever we said. Jesus seems frustrated. He seems exhausted from the tutoring that he's been doing. And now he's getting questions about the obvious, the obvious that we know people don't like to admit. 
but it's obvious. And this woman walks in asking for help. And Jesus uses her as an object lesson. He turns her into a children's sermon for those who should have already known better. He calls her a dog. It's not a mistranslation. There's no way that looking back at the Greek or the context or anything else changes it. He calls her a dog. It had to be painful for her. It had to be strange for the followers in the room. Jesus just said something ugly. Jesus just sounded unclean, at least to us. It's possible there they all said, that's about right. That's why they weren't understanding the first lesson. That's why they were pushing back. That's why they were struggling to understand what Jesus was talking about with the clean and the unclean. What comes out of the mouth? Ding, ding, ding. But the story is not over. The woman stays humble. She knows her role in society. This woman is still a mother in need for her child. And she could care less what that will say about her, what she needs to do in the relationship with Jesus and those in public. She is a mother who begins negotiating with Jesus, culturally negotiating. And Jesus is still Jesus, of course. But Jesus heals the child. Jesus is still Jesus, of course. So he affirms the mother. But it's still awkward. It's still hard to read. It's still hard to hear. On one level, we don't like Jesus being so complicated, so complex. But we really, really don't like Jesus reminding us that we're all biased. We don't like the filters that we have being named out loud. We don't like the injustices we feel helpless to fix being highlighted in front of us. We don't like... And typically in our culture, if we don't like something and how it makes us feel, we ignore it, we attack it, or we cancel it. These complexities make us feel insecure. And who wants to feel insecure when you have privilege? These complexities leave us exhausted, thinking way too hard. And who wants to think too hard when you can just kind of float? But today's scripture invites us to sit in the mess. To sit in the mess. It calls us to wrestle with the realities in which we live. We have lots of different cultures and identities. Those within them don't always agree on what that means. Those within them don't always see things the same way. You can't say, this person's black, so they think this way. This person's Asian, so they're going to act like this. We know that doesn't work. If you look at the military's form for ethnicity, there is Hispanic, and then there is Hispanic with white heritage. What? We can't even figure out how to label ourselves because these labels are so ambiguous. The labels tell maybe a history of where we came from, where our people have come from, the stories that impact the way we see the world, but they don't define us not individually. They give a lens into it, but they never tell the full story. So Jesus, frustrated, exhausted from all the tutoring he's been doing, starts talking about the obvious, the things we don't like to deal with, but what's right there in front of us in the story. This woman walks in asking for help, and Jesus uses her. It's awkward, but there's a lesson. He's already in the process of teaching, and so he rolls with it. This woman, though, won't let it be the end of the story. She keeps pushing against the cultural norms, against the role that she should have, and she keeps pushing. 
On one level, we don't like Jesus being so complicated, do we? It should be easier than that. Why can't it all just be in a list of 10 things that we memorize and move on? We don't like Jesus naming our realities, our filters. We don't like the injustices that we participate in being highlighted. There are worse injustices out there in history and around the world. You don't have to deal with ours. You don't have to meddle with our lives. But Jesus hands it to them in that room and in that space. Now, typically, if we don't like something in our culture, if we don't want to deal with something and how it makes it feel, we ignore it. We attack it. Somehow, Jesus meets in the middle of those tendencies. He doesn't ignore her. He doesn't necessarily attack her. But he deals with her as people would expect. And the ugliness of the moment, the ugliness of him calling her a dog becomes a lesson to the disciples. They're watching this. They're watching it unfold. And he says, why throw the scraps you know, the, the, the good food to the dogs. And rather than fighting it, she says, even the dogs get the scraps, Jesus. Jesus has called someone a dog in front of them, and you wonder how long it took them to connect. Oh, this is what he's talking about. Clean and unclean. Oh, we're the unclean. Oh. But right here in front of them, Jesus also looks unclean to us. And it's an awkward look. We have lots of different cultural identities. Those within them don't always agree on what they mean. They don't always see things the same way, but there are tendencies. There are profiles. Otherwise, advertising would not be so effective, right? There is diversity even within our diversities, though. Not all who identify as black vote the same. Not all who identify as Asian approach issues the same way. Some of our identities are grounded in food, traditions, and rituals. Some are based on shared history, experiences, and sorrows. And this matter, in Jesus' eyes, has some context but it doesn't get the last word. As we look at Jesus' understanding of culture, of identity, we realize this is someone who gathered with loved ones for ritual meals and shared traditions. Those disciples who were with Jesus were bound by a shared history of overcoming. It was part of their identity. So there are Multiple cultures at work in this room. There's Jesus and the Jewish community. There's Jesus and the Jewish community that's not of privilege. Fishermen, tax collectors. And then there's a woman from a nearby place that was once part of a kingdom that is no longer, who is described as Greek, Hellenist, also Syrophoenician, living in a place that used to be a part of their kingdom. Her identity is complicated. And we wade into this. We wade into it, wondering what it means for the relationships. We have lots of cultural identities within our space. Sometimes we really identify with our culture. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we shame one another. But you're voting against the community. Our people vote this way. Well, you know, not all our people see things the same way. Believe it or not, there are white people who don't always see things the same way. Who knew? Today's scripture invites us to sit in the mess of all that. To sit in the reality of all of it. We have lots of different cultural identities. Those within them don't always agree on what it means. We don't always see things the same way. But there are tendencies. We know there are profiles. 
and we have to wrestle with it. Some of our identities are thrust upon us. Some of them are watered down. What does it mean to be Italian, Irish, or German and not live in Italy, to not live in Ireland, to not be from Germany? In our American context, we have all these European cultural labels that often get whittled down to stereotypes, but most often to nostalgia as this larger cultural identity gets projected on top. Others are complicated and muddled by our culture and our media. What does it mean to be Native American, to be Jewish or Palestinian? We have refugees from all over the world who live among us. We wrestle with how to understand their story. We struggle to respond in ways that don't cause more harm. We don't want to sound unclean. We don't want what comes out of our mouth to embarrass us or hurt others. In some ways, we get what Jesus is saying. We are so caught up in not doing harm. Sometimes we just get caught up in what we say, what we think, what we do. And we miss the complexities of those around us. We miss what others might say to us. We miss what gifts they might bring us. So what does your culture say about God? What does your culture say about God? That means we have to identify a few things first, right? What is our culture? We have to think about who are the voices and the influences, the stories, the mythologies, the ancestors who shape who we are. What do they tell us about God? How do they inform the faith that we claim today? How do we understand mystery? How do we understand the nature of the world, the divine among us and beyond us? We miss what others might say to us if we don't think about their context, but even more so if we don't understand our own. We don't think about the ways we come to the scriptures. So what does your culture tell you about God? What does the community, the bubble you were raised within, tell you about the divine? Rather than having paranoia about our diversities, and all of us are a collection of them, rather than being paranoid of them, we need to develop a curiosity, a deep curiosity about the divine from each other's experience so that we get this bigger picture of God. We also need to have that same curiousness as we learn about Jesus. How did his culture impact the message he shared? How did the ethnicity of those he spoke to impact their understanding? How does this Syrophoenician woman of Hellenistic Greek descent understand the person of Jesus standing before her? And how much does that impact the fact that this is a mother begging for her child's life. At some point, our cultural barriers go away because what's at stake is, so, is too important, is so overwhelming to us. We need to bring the same curiosity we have about other cultures to our readings about Jesus. How did the culture Jesus lived in impact the way he spoke? The lessons he taught? How did the ethnicity of those he spoke to impact their understanding? How did the society in which the story unfolds inform the story? For some of you, this is a challenging thought, and for others, you're saying this is why we come to the United Church of Christ. As we continue this Lent journey, I invite you to think about Jesus through all our various lenses. How much do we think about Jesus' own cultural lens and help that impact the way we experience Jesus? How much do we think about the writers of the gospel and their cultural lens? Those who translated it, those who kept it over the years, those who taught it to us, at a particular time and place in our nation's culture and history. 
What are the blind spots of those who passed on the story? And what are the blessings of those times and cultures that carried over, attached themselves to the story we receive today? Who might that history lead us to call a dog? Who might see us as lesser as we try to proclaim a story about a God who sees us all the same? As we continue our Lent journey, thinking about Jesus through all of our various lenses, how much do we think about Jesus' own cultural lens? How much do we think about the writers of the gospel and how they engaged the story those who translated it through their own cultural lens, those who've continued to retell it through the lens of the culture and world they live in, those who even today translate it, share it, and proclaim it from an American prosperity lens. They're not trying to lead people astray. They're interpreting it in the context of where they live. That cultures are organic. They're conversations. They are conversations across generations, and we have to have the conversations for us all to grow. What lenses do you bring to this text? How does your culture give you an insight into Jesus that someone else might miss? How does your culture cloud some of the story and make it harder to grasp? How does the way a writer presented this story of Jesus make it accessible for us or more complicated? It's easy to take it at face value, to take what we receive, but we know that's led most of us to this place seeking something else. We know that literal translation has left most of us wounded and seeking God's grace in a new place. As we continue this Lent journey, may the cultures we claim, the cultures that claim us, may those lenses be brought to the text to open up understandings of Jesus' love in new ways. May the cultures that we come from be in conversation with each other so that we can begin to see God in new and amazing ways. I think I may have shared with you all last week when we were visiting the Jewish synagogue in Rome, we learned that in that Orthodox tradition, they could not pull out the Torah to read it unless they had at least 10 participants. It takes 10 different hearings for the word of God to be full. Less than that, we might get it wrong. Even in an Orthodox Jewish community, the idea that more than one point of view has to be brought to the story, else we find ourselves calling one another dogs, is important. We need your voice in this church family. We need those who are first generation, second generation, third, those who have just come from other cultures, those who identify with their cultures, those who are pushing back and struggling against them, those who are asking questions and those who are celebrating them. We need all of us in this conversation. As we continue this Lent journey, may the cultures we claim and may those around us expand our understanding of Jesus. May they reveal even more about the God we worship. And may they tell us, remind us, and celebrate who we are. Trusting that in us, in us, is the story of God's people. Amen.